Hello, welcome to Class 22 in our study of denominational doctrines. You know, I appeared on the talk show one time in Chattanooga that was live, Rick Igo's program, and Rick said, you know, uh, Wesley, what bothers me about you? Now, his program wasn't religious, but he allowed me to come on there to talk about religion. He said, you know what bothers me about you? He said, you and the Church of Christ... You say you got to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized in order to be saved. He said, what about that fellow that's on his way to be baptized and a limb falls out of the tree, hits him in the head and kills him deader than four o'clock? According to you, he'd be lost because he did not do what you declare he must do in order to be a child of God. I said, Rick, you got the same problem. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, what do you think one must do in order to be saved? Well, he was a Baptist. He said, well, I believe that he must believe in Jesus and pray and ask God to forgive him. I said, all right, Rick. Here is a man. He's heard the word of God preached. He's about ready to believe in the Christ. All of a sudden, lightning hits the building kills him deader than four o'clock. What about that man? Is he saved or is he lost? He looked at me and said, you know, I, I never had realized it until today, but I got the same problem you got. Friends, don't let people scare you off by trying to talk you out of what the Word of God actually says one must do to become a child of God. All of the heartbreaking circumstances in the world will not change the truth. Once you make one thing essential to salvation, you can always ask the question, what if a fellow didn't make it that far? For instance, faith in Christ. Now here's the atheist. He's in the hospital about to die. I go up there and I'm trying to talk to him. I get him to the point to where now he believes in God. I'm trying to sell him on Jesus and he dies of a heart attack. Well, what about that? Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's all I know to say. And the reason I'm sharing this with you over and over and over again, as I go into homes and study with people, as people call the radio program, they want to know about that fellow that didn't quite make it to where he needed to be in order to be saved. Well, friends, I'm sorry about that. But what about all of his other opportunities that he's had to obey God? You see, you and I, we can't say, well, because a fellow didn't make it to this point, we'll eliminate that commandment. Well, because a fellow didn't make it to this point, we'll eliminate that commandment. Well, because a fellow didn't make it to this point, we'll eliminate that commandment. Then you come to Jesus. Well, because a fellow didn't make it to far enough to have faith in Christ, we'll eliminate faith in Christ. By that process, you can eliminate every commandment in the Word of God. And we do not have the authority to do that. All I know to do, if I'm going to be faithful to God, is preach the truth and tell people, look, if you love God, you're going to have to obey that truth. If I love God, I'm going to have to obey that truth. Well, let's look at some more false doctrines that people advocate. We want to look at John 3, verse number 16. People misunderstand John 3.16. You know, when it comes to John 3.16, this is uh, probably the most familiar verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, if you should go out here and just start going from door to door and ask individuals, can you quote a Bible verse? And if so, would you quote me one? I would venture to say the majority of them would quote John 3, verse number 16. Now, I've had people tell me, this is the only verse you need. You don't need any other verse. My own brother has told me, this is the only verse you need. Well, if it's the only verse we need, God sure wasted a lot of space giving us all these others. Now, it's a great verse. You go to a football game. And you look, and somebody raises up a sign. It's got a Bible verse on it. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be John 3.16. And we love the verse. The verse teaches a glorious truth that all men everywhere 
must believe. But it's not the only verse in the Bible. I was preaching the Word of God in Pikeville, Tennessee, and I was trying to have a home Bible study with this gentleman, and I was going back from time to time and talking to him. And I said uh, to him one day, how's your Bible study coming? He said, well, I think I got it figured out, preacher. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, a fellow come by here the other day, and he told me if I wanted to know the truth, just read the book of John three times, and I'd know exactly what to do. Well, I knew exactly what that fellow was trying to get him to do. You see, the book of John is designed to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, thus deity. The Bible tells us that. John 20, 30, 31. Now, what that person wanted him to do was just read the book of John and for the most part just come to conclude that Jesus is, therefore believe that Jesus is, and that's all you need to do. Well, friends, thank God for the book of John. It's a beautiful verse, or a book, but it's not the only verses in the Bible. Thank God for John 3.16. It's a beautiful verse, but it's not the only verse in the Bible. And so then we've got to take all the Bible. I said, well, what's wrong with Matthew? Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and kept going. What's wrong with those books? Why wouldn't you want to read those? Read them all so that you can find out what God Almighty would have you do. And so that's what we've got to do. We've got to take the sum of God's Word and do what God says. Now look at that beautiful verse, John 3.16. For God, the greatest being, so loved, the greatest attribute, the world, the greatest creation, that he gave, the greatest act of love, his only begotten Son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest scope, believeth the greatest condition, in him should not perish the greatest condemnation, but have everlasting life, the greatest reward. Oh, it's a great verse. But a lot of people misunderstand what the verse teaches. Now, we want to look at some things about John 3 and verse number 16. We have those say, well, we're told that water is not mentioned there. Well, what about... John 3, 3 through 5. Isn't it amazing they read John 3, 16, and they forget other verses in the same chapter? They read John 3, 16 and say, well, I can't read about any water in John 3, 16. Well, what about John 3, beginning with verse number 3? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now watch this. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice, one has to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Jesus said that in John 3, 3 through 5. And you mean to tell me when Jesus gets down to verse number 16 of John 3, that somehow he no longer means nor believes what he said in John 3, 3 through 5? Friends, Jesus does not teach in that fashion. Jesus meant what he said in John 3, 3 through 5. How that a man must be born of water and of the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, if we're going to look at John 3.16 as the only verse, what about repentance? What are we going to do with that? The Bible teaches that man must repent. Are we going to take that command and just throw it plumb out of the Word of God because we cannot find it in John 3.16? Do you remember our study on faith? You remember that lesson? How that faith and belief is sometimes connected with the concept of obeying? That's what's involved right here in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him. Believeth what? What do you mean believe in Jesus? Well, do what he says. Let's say I'm sick and I go to the doctor. And the doctor says, look, if you take this medicine, this medicine, and this medicine, you'll get well. And I take that medicine and I put it in the medicine cabinet. And I tell my wife and I tell my children and other friends, boy, I tell you what, now I believe in that doctor. He is a great doctor. But then I won't take the medicine. 
Well, friends, I don't really believe in him. I don't trust him enough to do what he's asked me to do. Well, same way here. Jesus Christ is the great physician. He knows the remedy for sin. You and I don't trust him. We don't believe in him until we're willing to do what he has asked us to do. And that's the truth of the matter. So we can't throw out repentance. Jesus said, I tell you nay. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. Well, what about confession? We're going to throw confession out and just forget about it? You know, the Bible says, except you confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32, 33. Now, we noticed in our study uh, earlier how that some of the chief rulers in John 12 would not confess the Christ because they loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God. Well, you mean to tell me they were going to be saved and they would not confess Jesus Christ? Not at all. We can't throw confession out because it's not mentioned in John 3.16. The sum of God's word. That's what is truth. Not just take out a verse here and throw the rest of it away. It's the sum of God's word. Now, one reason that many preachers take this approach and individuals by saying John 3.16 is all we need, they do not like water baptism. Let no one kid you. They don't like what the Bible says one has to do in order to be saved. But now, who is a, a believer, a true believer? You know, the Bible shows us who a true believer is if we'll just compare Acts 2 and verse number 44. Now, don't forget this. I'm going to use it a couple times, I believe, in this program. But don't forget Acts 2.44. This is vital to showing people the truth on who a believer is. Now, let me read to you Acts 2, verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Now, John 3.16 says believers will be saved. Wesley, you believe that? Absolutely. But what we've got to do is find out who a believer is. We've got to be able to go into people's homes and help them and show them who a believer is. Now, again, on the day of Pentecost, we have Peter and the other apostles preaching their hearts out, trying to get these people to believe in the Christ and obey the Christ. Well, about 3,000 of them were pricked in their heart and cried out, Men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said to them in Acts 2.38, Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, when you read verse number 41, notice their attitude. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Those that gladly received the word of God, they were baptized. Now, after they did this, friends, they heard the preaching of the apostles. They were convinced that the apostles were telling them the truth, and they wanted to do what these men were going to tell them to do. They trusted that these men were truly the men of God because of all the miraculous signs going on that day and so forth, and the fulfillment of prophecy. And so they cried out, what must we do? They were told to repent and be baptized. They gladly did that, but watch this. After they gladly did that, the Bible says, and all that believed were together. Notice, if you will, they were called believers after they heard the preaching of the word. They asked, what must I do to obey? They were told what to do to obey, repent, be baptized. After they did that, they were called believers, and John 3.16 says that believers will be saved. We love John 3.16. We believe John 3.16. But it's got to be understood correctly. Well, let's go to Acts 16, 30 and 31. We have preachers, again, who come to these verses, and they leave the impression that this is all you need to know. You just uh, accept John 6, uh, all right, rather Acts 16, 30 and 31, and Acts 16, 30 and 31 is all you need. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Listen to these verses. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, 
and thy house. Now notice, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Preachers read that, that's all you need. Here in Acts 16, 30, 31, they read it and they stop as if though the word of God says nothing about it in this context. Well, that's not the case. Now, if they were saved at this point, folks, they were saved without faith. I know that because Paul had not preached to them yet. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Acts 16, verse number 32. See, he tells them that they're going to have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But he hasn't preached to them yet. Here's a Philippian jailer, a heathen, he and his family. They don't know what to do to be saved. And so then he preaches unto them the word of God. Now again, we ask, what about repentance? You're just going to throw repentance out? It mentions faith. But what about repentance? We can't just come along because some verse says you, you are to believe and leave the impression that's all you got to do, and repentance does not matter. That is not the case at all. Notice when the Bible calls them believers. This is very important. If they just continue to read, they would find out when these individuals became believers. In Acts 16.34... And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Notice, he's called a believer after he was willing to wash the stripes of those who had been beaten, after he and his household were willing to go and be baptized the same hour of the night, after they did that, the Bible calls them believers. Not before. You see, they had to do whatever the Lord commanded before they could be believers. Another question, why go the same hour of the night if baptism is not necessary to salvation? Notice, they went the same hour of the night. Now, here's a jailer. His life is on the line. If he lets the prisoners loose, he takes the prisoners and goes somewhere, and he's baptized the same hour of the night. Why do that if baptism is not essential to salvation? And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, that shows repentance, and was baptized, he and all his straight way. Now friends, you won't read in the Bible where anybody who became a child of God after the Lord's church was established, who had the attitude, well, now I believed, and three weeks later, if you want to, we'll get a group together and we'll go, we'll be baptized. No. Because they knew the importance of baptism. They knew that it was in order to be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. They knew that it was for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. They knew that it was to give one a good conscience. 1 Peter 3, 21. And on we could go. They knew that it would put one into Christ. Well, with this knowledge, and they saw the importance of it, and those who preached knew the importance of it, then they said, you need to do it now. Just like Ananias. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. It was something they needed to do right then. Not put off, but do right then. Again, we could compare this to Acts 2 and verse number 44. And don't forget that verse where people in Acts 2, 44 are called believers. But they're called believers only after they were willing to repent and to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit called them believers. And John 3, 16 says that believers will be saved. We love John 3.16. We believe John 3.16. But we've got to understand it within the context of the entire Bible. Well, let's go to another uh, couple of verses that's misunderstood. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Now, when we think about the Ephesian brethren here, of whom it was said that they were saved by grace through faith, we'd like to ask the question, what did they do to be saved? By grace. Through faith. You know, again, if you listen to these denominational preachers, they want you to believe that it's through grace or by grace through faith only. That's what they want you to believe. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, if I can read in the Bible 
what these Ephesian brethren did to be saved, I will know what it means to be saved by grace through faith. And if I'll do the same, then I too can be saved by grace through faith. It's that simple, folks. In Acts 19, beginning with verse number 17, notice what the Word of God says. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. Now notice we're talking about those who are at Ephesus. We're talking about the Ephesians. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Now really you got three things they did here. They believed, they confessed, and they showed their deeds, simply meaning they were willing to straighten up anything that was wrong, which would carry with it the concept of repentance. But now the only thing we want out of that verse is faith. Now, the reason I'm saying that, we're going to show you they did these other things. It comes right out and says it. Of course, it comes right out and says there they confessed as well. But now notice they repented. Acts 20, verse number 17 and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, testifying both to the Jews and also of, uh, to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice we've got repentance and faith mentioned in these verses, showing what these individuals did in order to become a child of God. Then I want you to notice they confessed in Acts 19, beginning with verse number 17, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Notice they confessed. So far we've noticed they have believed, they have repented, they have confessed, but that's not all they did. They were baptized. In Acts 19, beginning with verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass that while, Paul, uh, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of re repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now, here's what we got. The people at Ephesus, when you take the totality of what they did by studying the various things they did in Ephesus. They believed, they repented, they confessed, and they were baptized. Now Paul, trying to encourage them, wrote an epistle to them, the book of Ephesians. And in the book of, the, of Ephesians he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, since I know what they did to become a child of God, I know what it means to be saved by grace, true faith. And then when I take that and com compare that to the Great Commission, it's in harmony. When I compare this to what happened on the day of Pentecost, it's in harmony. When I compare this with the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, it harmonizes. When I compare this with the conversion of Cornelius, complete harmony. So I know what it means to be saved by grace through faith because of the sum of God's word being true. Well, another verse that people often misuse is that of Acts 10, verse number 43. And here's what the verse says. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now notice, all the prophets gave witness. Well, Joel was one of those prophets that gave witness. And he was 
appealed to on the day of Pentecost by an inspired man, Peter and the other apostles, as they preached the truth. Now notice Acts 10 says, all the prophets gave witness to something. All right, what did all the prophets give witness to? They gave witness to the fact that whosoever would believe on the name of Jesus Christ would receive the remission of sins. Now, denominational preachers go to this verse and say, see, faith only. You believe, you get the remission of sins. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's go back and see what the prophets have told us. Let's see if we can figure out how the prophets were understood by inspired men. In Acts 2, verse number 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So an inspired man quotes one of those prophets that was trying to tell us what to do to be saved. I know he was because verse number 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, still quoting that prophet. So then Peter preaches, and these people cry out, Men and brethren, what must we do? Now wait a minute, Peter. Before you give any answer, keep in mind that the prophet Joel and all prophets, according to Acts 10, 43, bore witness to the fact that if one would believe on Jesus, he would receive the remission of sins. Keep that in mind, Peter, before you give any answers. Well, he did. And he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41 again says, They that gladly received his word were baptized. Verse number 44 of Acts 2 calls on believers... And these believers had the remission of sins, and they did what was in harmony with the prophets because Joel was appealed to. See how beautiful the Bible fits together? And yet, these preachers come along, they think they found them a verse that's going to teach faith only. No, the verse does not teach faith only. The Bible nowhere teaches faith only. To start with, folks, how in the world can you, how in the world can I conclude that some verse teaches that one is saved by faith only when the Bible says, you see then, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone or only. See, nowhere does the Bible teach you're saved by faith only. Then the Bible comes right out and says you're not saved or justified by faith only. So if you and I understand the Bible correctly, we know that salvation does not come by faith only. Now what happened? Martin Luther, overreacting to what the Catholics had done, went to Romans 1, 17, and wrote the word only in his Bible, started to teach that, promote that, as strongly as he knew how, and many people, well, most religious people, who claim to believe in Christianity, now believe that, basically. That one is saved at the point of faith only. But the Bible teaches just the opposite. And you and I, we're under a God-given obligation to believe what the Bible says on the subject. Well, another verse that people often misuse is 1 Corinthians 1, 17. They misuse this to try to show that one does not have to be baptized at all. Listen to what the verse says. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. On radio one time, a preacher called in and said, Wesley, if I can prove to you that baptism is not essential to salvation. Will you go off the air? Hey, I said, I'll make you a better deal than that. If you can prove to me that baptism is not essential to salvation, I'll repent. And then I'll teach what you understand to be the truth on the air. Isn't that a better deal? He said, well, I've got the verse. I said, well, if you've got the verse, I'd like to hear you read it. And so then he turned to 1 Corinthians 1, and verse number 17, and read this. For Christ sent me not to baptize. So he said, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now notice he said, Wesley, Paul was not sent to baptize. He was sent to preach the word of God. And what Paul was trying to say 
in 1 Corinthians 1.17 is that baptism is not essential to salvation. I said, how in the world did you get that out of that verse? Now to start with, folks, I know that Paul was sent to baptize. I know that. Since I know that, I know this has to be in a, an elliptical sentence, which means that a key word has been dropped because it's understood. And I'm going to give you some more examples in just a moment. First of all, you might say, Wesley, how do you know that Paul was sent to baptize? I know that because he preached under the Great Commission. I asked that preacher, did Paul preach under the Great Commission? He had to say yes. I asked him this, does the Great Commission teach that you're to go into all nations, make disciples of all people, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? He had to say yes. Well, then I know then, if Paul preached under, under the Great Commission, that he was to go forth, make disciples, and baptize people. I know that. It's that simple. And since I know that, then I know this is an elliptical sentence. When I was at Red Bank High School in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I had no idea what an elliptical sentence was and did not know anything about the Word of God, absolutely nothing. One day, the English teacher teaching on elliptical sentences put this verse right here on the board. Now, I don't know what she was religiously, but she put 1 Corinthians 1.17 on the board as being an example of an elliptical sentence. You know, she said this, since we know that Paul was preaching under the Great Commission and so forth, he was sent to baptize people and make disciples out of them. So this is an elliptical sentence. Well, like I say, I didn't know anything about the Word of God at that time. Well, you might say, well, what's an elliptical sentence? Let me give you some examples. In John 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Wait a minute. Here it says, don't labor for the meat that perisheth. God doesn't want you out here working. That's the way you would take it if you just read it and didn't take into consideration the rest of the Bible. But the Bible says, if any man will not work, neither should he eat. So I know the Bible's teaching that one is to work for his daily food. I know that. The Word of God teaches that. Therefore, I know that this is an elliptical sentence because I've considered the evidence found in the Word of God, the sum of that evidence, and the sum of that evidence says that a man is to work and feed his own household, and if he will not, the Bible says, he is, a, he is worse than an infidel. Now notice the verse again. Labor not for that meat which, which perisheth. And here is an elliptical sentence. In other words, labor not only for that food which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. So here's another elliptical sentence. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now think about that. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. That's an elliptical sentence. Jesus is saying, He that believeth on me, believeth not only on me, but on him that sent me. See, Jesus was trying to say, if you believed on him, then you were also believing in his Father. He was not trying to say, if you believed on him, that you did not believe on him. But that's what some would have to conclude if they did not understand the principle of an elliptical sentence. Then listen to this. 1 Timothy 5, 23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. Now was the Apostle Paul trying to tell Tim Timothy, you can't drink water anymore. If you drink water, you'll be doing wrong. No, he's saying drink no longer water. Only. See, it's an elliptical sentence. But use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. Now here Paul is saying that he was not sent to baptize only, but to preach the gospel. 
Well, what was the problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? They had begun to call themselves after the one, apparently, who had baptized them. Paul was saying that I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you because I don't want to be a party to having this sect over here and this here and this here and this group over here cause division like that is wrong. It is not authorized. Now I compare this to the life of Christ and what Christ did. In John 4, beginning with verse number 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Now, Jesus baptized more than John did, even though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples did. Well, Jesus, since you didn't go forth baptizing, literally, you didn't do the actual baptizing, then apparently you don't think baptism is too important. Well, listen to what he said. In Luke 7, beginning with verse number 29, And all the people that heard him, speaking of John, and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. When they were not baptized with John's baptism, when they refused that, the word of God said they rejected the counsel of God against themselves. And friends, if you and I refuse to do what the word of God says relative to baptism in the name of Jesus, then we also reject the counsel of God against ourselves. Don't forget the apostle Paul preached under the Great Commission, which said, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Now, if he preached under the Great Commission, he had to do that. And not only that, I know he baptized certain people. When you read the context of 1 Corinthians. Now he said he baptized Crispus, Gaius, and some others. Well, if he wasn't sent to baptize, and yet he did baptize, then he violated the law of God. No, he wasn't sent to baptize only, but to preach the word of God, to preach the gospel. Now, if Christ did not send him to baptize, as I mentioned a moment ago, then, my friends, he had no authority to baptize anybody. And if he baptized anyone, then that baptism wouldn't be valid. But the Lord did send him to baptize, but that was not his only mission, but to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we can see the truth in this context. Paul did not want people calling themselves Paulites. He didn't want people to name themselves and call themselves for Apollos or for Simon Peter. He wanted them to follow Jesus Christ. He said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Then don't call yourself a Paulite. That's the only point he was trying to make. And it's sad that people would misuse 1 Corinthians 1.17 to try to do away with a commandment of God, and they acknowledge it is a commandment. Let's not be guilty of that. Thank you for being with us. Hope you'll join us next time.